Hey everyone, today I'm going to teach you about a pretty cool fern. But first, I need to tell you about the challenges of being a plant in the temperate region. Unlike most animals, plants can't move around their environment. And while this seems like an obvious statement, it poses some serious problems for most plants. For example, pollen needs to move from one flower to another for fertilization to occur. And also, seeds need to be dispersed far distances so that they don't fall directly near their parent plant and compete for resources. There are adaptations to fruit and seed dispersal found all around us. For instance, there are many plants that have fleshy and bright colored fruits that are dispersed by animals. Uh, there are also many plants that have winged or haired fruits or seeds that are dispersed by wind. When it comes to dispersing their pollen, plants also take advantage of similar strategies. We're all familiar with pollinators like butterflies and bees that move from flower to flower carrying pollen. However, there are many plants that use wind as a vector for moving their pollen. And almost always, these plants shed their pollen early in the spring before leaf out. Now, why might this be? This birch is about to open its male flowers and release its pollen. Now imagine you're a pollen grain, and you have to get from here all the way to here and land on a female flower. Now that would be much more difficult with a canopy full of leaves impeding you. Much like pollen in these species, fern spores are very small and almost always dispersed by the wind. This brings us to our main character, the sensitive fern, which is a native species to New England and has a very interesting mechanism of spore dispersal. While most ferns in the temperate region produce and disperse their spores, later in the growing season, on this year's leaves, the sensitive fern is unique in that it produces its spores in these heavily modified leaves, and rather than dispersing them this year, these heavily modified leaves persist through the winter, and finally, in the spring, they release their spores as soon as the snow is melting. Doesn't this timing sound familiar? It's thought that this species releases its spores during this time for the same reason that wind-pollinated plants release their pollen early in the spring before leaf out occurs. In this way, this species can release its spores and have them travel far distances without being impeded by a full canopy of leaves or an understory of herbaceous plants and shrubs. The snow has just started to melt away. And you can see that this leaf, which was produced this past year, is just starting to release its spores. In fact, I can see that some of these pinnules, or leaflets, are just starting to open, and others are still closed. So we have a pretty good working hypothesis as to why this species releases its spores early in the spring. However, we do not know how, structurally, this species achieves this timing. The sensitive fern is very common across the eastern U.S. And pteridologists, scientists who study ferns, have documented this phenomenon of early spring spore dispersal for over 200 years. To my surprise, I realized that no one had investigated the anatomical and physiological mechanism of spore dispersal in this species. We know that movement in other plant structures, like the scales of pine cones, depends on changes in cell structure and moisture status. So I wanted to figure out if the same thing was true in the sensitive fern. To figure this out, we have to go into the lab. Follow me. I first started this project during the COVID-19 lockdown when I didn't have access to the labs. Instead, I was collecting all of my data in my apartment. Now that the labs have reopened, I've been able to utilize all the equipment here, including this dissecting microscope, this time-lapse photography setup, and this scanning electron microscope, and this drying oven. <laughs> 
and this growth chamber, and this coffee maker. So using this equipment, I wanted to figure out how the plant's structure allows it to disperse its spores in the early spring. So let's take a closer look. As each pinnule or leaflet opens, it exposes dozens of spore packets, which are called sporangia, to the environment. Here we can see the pinnules are fully opened, revealing the sporangia which house the spores. For the majority of the year, these pinnules are closed. So, what caused them to open up? The first experiment that I tried was to put these leaves in water, and to my surprise, I found that the pinnules were fully closed within a minute. I hypothesized that, much like scales on a pine cone, these pinnules close when they're wet and open when they're dry. But how sensitive are they to changes in moisture? I put the leaves in a growth chamber, which allowed me to specifically control humidity. I then measured the relative openness of pinnules at different percent humidity. I found that pinnules are not just opened or closed. Rather, pinnule openness is a response to differences in humidity. Okay, so movement depends on moisture. But how do plants move? Unlike animals, plants don't have muscles, so movement depends on structure at the cellular level. And to look at this, we're going to need a stronger microscope. This is a scanning electron microscope, and it's going to allow us to take a look inside of the plant cells. If we take a single pinnule and cut it in half, we can place this into the microscope and start to visualize the internal structure. We see that not all of the cells look the same. The cells on the top look different from the cells on the bottom and there are two key differences between them. To describe these differences, we need to understand the basic structure of a plant cell. Plant cells are surrounded by strong cell walls, and these walls are made of microscopic fibers. The first difference we notice is that the cells on the bottom have a much thinner cell wall than those on the top, which means these bottom cells are much more flexible. The second difference is how the fibers are arranged in the cell wall. As you can see here in the upper cells, fibers are oriented perpendicular to the length of the cell. In contrast, fibers are oriented parallel to the length in the lower cells. This is a simple model of cells on the upper and lower side of a pinnule. When it absorbs water, the cells on the top expand in this direction, like an accordion, and this is because of the orientation of the fibers in their cell walls. The cells on the lower side, in contrast, do not expand, and this is because their fibers are oriented in the opposite direction. However, because they have thin cell walls, they're quite flexible, which means they can bend. This dynamic allows for the pinnules to close when it's wet and open when it's dry. Incredibly, this cellular structure is a near-perfect match to what we find in a pine cone. And because these two species are separated by hundreds of millions of years of evolution, we can be pretty sure that they evolved independently. This is an example of convergent evolution. A more common example is how wings have evolved independently in both birds and bats. Interestingly, these humidity responsive structures in the plant world have inspired architects and engineers to create climate responsive materials that can move without consuming energy. These new materials are part of a wave of sustainable architecture inspired by nature. So next time you're out on a walk in the woods, keep your eye out for this marvel of green engineering, the sensitive fern. <laughs>